Hey, welcome everyone. My name is Courtney Dogger, and I'm the president of Network 2020. Uh, for those who are joining us for the first time, we are a nonprofit and we're really focused on bridging the gap between the private sector and the international affairs community. Um, we're really striving to make international affairs and conversations around what's happening in the world accessible to a lot of people and really trying to create a better informed citizenry that can contribute to conversations in their communities. So thank you for being a part of that. Um, today, we're going to have a very needed conversation about the use of surveillance in China as part of our deep dives on China. Um, and I think it's important just to acknowledge that the phenomena of, govern of government surveillance is not new and nor is it uh, endemic to China alone. But I think it's interesting how the confluence of technological advances, the political system in which China operates, and the interest from other countries in acquiring these systems make it a very important conversation to have about China and its 1.4 billion people. And I think it's an important component of the deep dive that we're doing on China, where we're, we're having a series of conversations that look at China's um, politics, uh, security, economics, relations with the U.S., and really trying to go deep on a, on a very important issue. Um, so you can learn more about the deep dive on China on our website, um, and I think we'll put up some information later on during the conversation. So with that, it's my honor today to welcome three terrific panelists. Um, first, we have um, Dr. Emil Dirks, and he is a research associate at the Citizen Lab at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy at the University of Toronto, where he explores state surveillance, policing, and civil society in China. So welcome. Uh, we also have uh, Bulelani Jili, and he is a Meta Research PhD fellow at Harvard University, where he focuses on Africa-China relations, U.S.-China competition, cybersecurity, ICT development, and a lot of other topics. Um, and last but not least, we are pleased to welcome Maya Wang, who is the Associate Director in the Asia Division at Human Rights Watch, where she has researched and written extensively on a wide range of issues in China, including the use of torture, arbitrary detention, human rights defenders, civil society, disability rights, and women's rights, as well as um, doing a lot of work in uh, Xinjiang and Tibet as well. So welcome to the three of you, and thank you so much for being here today. Maya, I'd like to start with you. And um, would you mind just giving us a brief background on the history and ideology behind China's surveillance system? And just so that we can also put that in context when we're trying to understand from our own perspectives, many of us sitting in the United States, what are the reactions that you've heard about from people across the country? Hello. Hi, um, yes. can you hear me? Because I've, I've got two devices, not entirely sure where I'm speaking from, um, but I think um, you can hear. Um, very um, glad to be speaking here um, today. Um, I would just start by saying that, you know, um, the development of surveillance in China is not um, a, a straight line, really, and it's not really transparent where um, how all these kind of um, influences come together. But as far as we know, and uh, because you know, China, the Chinese government is quite um, uh, a bit of a black box, um, at least um, uh, in in these kind of matters and policy matters. Um, but as far as we can tell, um, there are several kind of um, confluence of factors. First of all, I mean, the, the Chinese government has, of course, long participated or long been, um, you know, surveilling or connect. Um, uh, um, has been collecting large amounts of information from people. There are various social control methods from um, since the Chinese Communist Party became came into power. Um, uh, there are, you know, uh, Hukou, Danwei, Dang'an. These are kind of, you know, systems in China that control and also collect information at at the basic um, societal levels. Uh, but these kind of like low tech uh, ways of collecting information essentially became obsolete as um, you know um, the Chinese society become more um, economically developed as migration of workers went from places where people live in one place and therefore can be more easily controlled to essentially moving around the country. So the government needed new ways of monitoring the, the um, population um, as well as you had the 1989 pro-democracy movement, more and more people after 2000 lived their lives on online and have a digital life. 
Um, and all of these essentially meant that um, a lot of the, you know, the, the government were kind of grappling with, you know, new ways of, of monitoring, collecting information on people. At the same time, in the West, you have the UK where you, uh, there's a new policing um, kind of uh, um, um, doctrine, as you wish, called intelligence-led policing. Um, that is about placing intelligence um, at the center of policing, uh, kind of more about preventive policing. Uh, and that kind of um, doctrine influences how the Chinese police think about policing as well. Um, and in early 2000, the Chinese government started implementing this um, project called the Golden Shield Project, which kind of laid the groundwork for um, the, the surveillance systems we see today. Um, and then along the way, you also have, you know, the 2008 Olympics, the G20 in Hangzhou in 2016, all of those kind of prevented, uh, provided an opportunity for the police to essentially go on a shopping spree. Um, so, so all of these things, um, and then in Xinjiang and then in Tibet, you have um, the Tibetan protest around the um, 2000 Olympics, you have the Urumqi riots also around the same time, uh, the war on terror in the U.S., all of which kind of provided impetus in these particular regions, which the Chinese government considered to be kind of quote unquote more restive um, to put in place specific um, surveillance infrastructure. So often kind of push them all towards um, that kind of what we see today, of course, but then they, again, there is like no straight line, but many kind of different influences that come together. Um, as to your second part of your question, Courtney, that like how much uh, people in China um, understand or react to these surveillance, I think part of that is that people in China, um, they, they generally have a sense that they have to be quite careful about what they say, because, you know, like I said, Chinese government has a long history of surveillance using kind of low tech, you know, human to human surveillance. So people in China generally are very, very careful. But on the other hand, um, uh, they don't really know exactly how the government conducts all these surveillance. Um, and, and if you talk of activists, activists would be like, oh yeah, no, we get followed. There are surveillance cameras pointing at my home. But then that, those are like more kind of targeted surveillance of named individuals versus mass surveillance, which is what we're talking about, the kind of the, the wise collection of data. Um, so it, the interesting thing is often, I think outside of China, you have more detailed research about the Chinese government surveillance, and we probably know more about these surveillance systems, um, if it's accurately understood, than the people inside China. Um, so I'll just stop there. Wonderful. Uh, thank you so much. Um, Emil, turning to you, what are China's current technological capabilities, including the gathering of biometric data? And again, as Maya pointed out, we're talking about just the, the mass surveillance and, and whose data is being collected? Um, so it's very clear that the Xi administration has massively expanded domestic surveillance programs. Um, this is not only because the technologies uh, that they're using have advanced both in China and outside, it's also because the C administration has a very expansive view of what it considers to be threats to national security, social stability, and one-party rule. Um, and in turn, under the C administration, Chinese police have subjected ever greater numbers of Chinese citizens to invasive or mass surveillance. Um, probably one of the clearest examples of this is in the area of biometric surveillance, which is the focus of a lot of the work that I've been doing at the Citizen Lab. Um, so prior to the C administration, Chinese police tended to collect biometric data, things like DNA samples, um, as part of forensic investigations or as part of missing person investigations, um, or from groups that the police referred to as target people, who are individuals that the police view as threats to social stability. This could include anyone from users of drugs to practitioners of banned faiths to people with uh, mental health issues or people in community corrections. Um, however, what we've seen under the Xi administration since uh, 2012 is that the police uh, biometric surveillance programs have massively expanded, um, especially since the mid-2010s, police have begun to collect biometric data from people who are not suspected of any particular criminal offense, uh, nor are they involved in any particular missing person investigation. Um, what's more, police have begun to target not just individuals, but entire regions or communities for mass biometric data collection. Um, probably the most infamous example of this is in Xinjiang, where mass biometric data collection was an integral part of state repression against Uyghurs, Kazakhs, and other ethnic minority peoples. Um, however, we've seen this in other regions as well. Um, two of the most striking examples of region-wide uh, police biometric surveillance 
come from the Tibet Autonomous Region and Qinghai Province, both of which are in Western China, and both of which have large ethnic and religious minority populations. So in the Tibet Autonomous Region between 2016 and 2022, Police are estimated um, to have collected DNA samples from between one quarter to one third of the entire population of the region. And in Qinghai, between 2019 and 2022, police have collected iris scans from roughly one fifth to one quarter of the region's entire or the province's entire population. Um, publicly available records show that the collection of biometric data in these cases is not related to particular criminal investigations, um, that it's occurring in everywhere from private homes to public squares to businesses to schools. Um, not only are adults being targeted in the Tibet Autonomous Region in Xinhai for mass biometric data collection, uh, in both cases, police have collected biometric data from children as young as elementary school age, sometimes going to classrooms uh, with the assistance of teachers to collect data from, from children. Uh, we also know that in those both of those regions, um, we've seen evidence of Buddhist nuns or monks having their data collected by police, or members of Hui Muslim communities have also been targeted. Um, so in effect, these programs are a form of basically mass discriminatory policing, where entire communities are treated as potential threats to social stability or national security without evidence, and in fact, without any real basis in domestic Chinese law. Now, yes. given that there are very few external checks on the power of China's police, uh, save for the Communist Party itself, um, police likely have wide remit to use the collected DNA samples or iris scans for whatever purpose they see fit. Um, probably one of the most immediate uses of these biometric data surveillance programs, though, is just, maybe to Maya's point, is just reminding people that the state is watching them. So the knowledge that the police can violate your right to privacy with impunity uh, may lead these Chinese citizens in these er uh, areas of China to restrict their activities, right? Their social activities, their private activities, so as not to attract further state harassment or repression. Um, in fact, I think we should view mass biometric surveillance as part and parcel with broader programs of state surveillance or repression, both within those particular regions and across China as a whole. And collectively, these programs raise the costs of even modest resistance to the Chinese state. Um, they also sharply constrain the ability of Chinese citizens to exercise their basic civil and political rights um, including the right to freedom of expression or the right to privacy. Um, and I think it's this, it's this constraining aspect, um, which is the most worrying aspect of police-led mass biometric data collection in China. Again, a unique feature of the uh, the currency administration. Thanks. And, and just one one follow-up. Uh, you, you mentioned how, um, you know, sometimes police would, would even go to schools. I'm just curious, you know, how, how does this collection often happen? Is it, you know, you mentioned, you know, public squares or, um, I, I mean, is it is it that, that police are looking for certain populations and they're just setting up shop and grabbing anyone who comes by and, you know, says we need an iris scan or, you know, how, how does how does it work in reality, the collection of data? So what seems to be the case, based on the publicly available sources that I've seen, um, these are often uh, blog posts done by public security linked uh, on public security linked social media accounts. Um, it seems that it happens in a few ways. So in some cases, they will put out an announcement saying we're going to be coming into this particular community and we're going to be collecting data for a particular purpose. Um, oftentimes, the purposes are very vague. Um, they'll say we're doing this to build up our capacity to conduct forensic investigations. We're doing this to assist in future missing person investigations. We're doing this for the purpose of uh, upgrading national ID cards. We'll give some explanation. They'll come in and they'll request that people come to a particular location to have their data collected. Um, in other cases, it seems they take advantage of areas where people are congregating, right? Like a school or maybe a, an event at a public square. And they use that as an opportunity to set up a table or you know, set up uh, a few officers to collect data in that particular instance. Um, and then finally, there are uh, times where it seems the police are actually going home to home or business to business to actually collect data from particular uh, groups of people. Um, however, just to emphasize the point I made earlier, which is that it doesn't seem to me that they're being very specific about who they're targeting. There's no indication that they're going after individuals who are suspected of engaging in anti-state activities or who have a criminal record, are implicated in some kind of criminal investigation, or are suspected of 
engaging in human trafficking or themselves being a victim of human trafficking. It really seems to be you're going into a particular area with or without notice and asking uh, people to comply with a request for biometric data. And I think that's probably the best, uh, a good point maybe to, to add on the end here, which is that given the, the authority of the Chinese police, um, given the authority of police in many countries, but especially in China, I think it would be very hard for people to refuse a request from the police to surrender uh, biometric data in these instances. Um, again, given the authority of the Chinese police, given the political system, the authoritarian political system. Um, so effectively, um, these are requests for data collection and their uh, compliance is effectively compulsory. Th th thank you for that clarification. Um, Bulalani, uh, looking, widening our scope now, how to where and why are these tools of surveillance being exported abroad? And does this have the potential to promote a system of digital authoritarianism in other countries? Uh, sure. Uh, firstly, uh, thank you for having me. Um, and in kind of regards to the proliferation of kind of Chinese surveillance systems um, into the global south, and in particular Africa, um, there are a number of reasons uh, behind the general proliferation. Um, generally, I kind of put them into three boxes. At one level, it's uh, about, you know, Chinese corporate expansion. Uh, so uh, many Chinese companies, including the likes of uh, ZTE and Huawei, have found uh, business to be lucrative in the global south. And in particular, you know, Africa, I think currently about 70% of Africa's ICT infrastructure is built by Huawei alone. And so they've kind of been a key agent in building the infrastructural capacity um, of Africa. Um, and then uh, another kind of key point is kind of, you know, Chinese geopolitical interests. Um, China is very much interested. Uh, in promoting uh, both uh, its kind of technologies, but also some of its kind of normative values on the continent. And uh, one particular kind of salient idea is known as kind of cyber sovereignty, which um, is effectively, you know, a notion that the internet should be both governed and restricted uh, by the state. And so this idea in particular is mostly promoted using bilateral and sometimes uh, multilateral institutions. This includes kind of like FOCAP, which is kind of the main uh, platform uh, that China engages uh, with African countries. And um, lastly, I kind of say, uh, it's really about kind of domestic demand factors. Um, many African countries are both aiming to ameliorate traditional challenges like infrastructure gaps, while simultaneously also aiming to deal um, with kind of domestic uh, uh, social challenges like crime and terror. And so when companies are offering these surveillance systems, they usually come under the guise of development or under the guise of crime reduction. And so they're, they're uh, with, you know, uh, permissible grounds in order to support some of the domestic efforts. Uh, and, you know, in particular, you know, Chinese companies, but also the Chinese state has generally promoted these instruments in the context of the global south as a way to uh, address challenges. Now, you know, uh, the reality is, is that like, you know, there is no kind of robust evidence um, empirically that kind of draws a direct correlation, say, with the use of surveillance systems with the reduction of crime or the use of surveillance systems with the reduction of terror. And in fact, um, some of the surveillance systems that have been installed um, in African cities like uh, Nairobi have not been able to actually reduce crime. Uh, and so it kind of raises a series of challenges, both for kind of domestic actors, but also for the corporations themselves who've been promoting some of these systems um, on the ground. Um, and more, more than anything, what it's usually done is that it's um, arrived under the guise of development, but without the necessary infrastructure in order to support the general promotion of civil liberties. And so, for example, in the context of, say, Kenya, what you find is, you know, the government has procured some of these surveillance systems that range from kind of biometric identification systems all the way to facial recognition uh, capabilities, uh, really from uh, the mid-2015s on ostensibly permissible grounds, 
but the government only put together a data protection law and uh, around 2019. And so the data protection law of Kenya is really almost about two and a half years old. That in particular has actually not really come into a current effect. It's mostly uh, uh, currently at the kind of uh, promotional phase. And so while there's been a growing, you know, uh, want for these systems for permissible grounds that usually come under, um, you know, the guise of development without actually supporting development while simultaneously also then exacerbating general trepidations around the general misuse. And there have been kind of growing uh, cases um, across the global south, including Kenya, with the general misapplication of these surveillance systems. Now, whether or not you can directly draw a correlation between that and the Chinese trying to promote a kind of dystopic future is a bit of a more difficult correlation to make. But uh, making the general correlation that uh, the misuse of surveillance systems and the proliferation of these technologies is kind of an easier argument to make, um, in part because many of these general systems come without much uh, checks and balances. Um, and you know the, those general gaps are both a consequence of, say, of kind of domestic actors, but also um, you know uh, corporate actors not willing and not wanting to participate in kind of uh, impact assessments of the use of their technologies in the context of the global south. Um, yeah. So yeah, j j just to follow up on that quickly, um, you know, you, you made the point that that the that the systems often, um, you know, you 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 can have the the right regulatory framework, which it seems like you, you've seen at least in Kenya, it's lagging, um, and then there's also the the wider social system into which they're put, you know, say say civil mm -hmm. society, for example. What have you been seeing in terms of public reaction? You know, if these systems are being put in place for you know, ostensibly for for crime reduction, um, what's the what's the sense from the general populace, and is there pushback, and is there civil society activity around um, the use of these systems? Yeah, sure. So there there has been general growing concerns about the general proliferation of these systems in local contexts like uh, Kenya, but also uh, you know there have been uh, multiple countries uh, across the continent that have been trying to generally address the trepidations around the. Uh, uh, misuse of surveillance systems. Um, I should say, maybe kind of giving, taking a step back and kind of giving a broader view of things. If you look into the context of Africa, for example, only about 50% of African countries have a data protection law in place. Um, and all of those countries that do have data protection laws in, in place, they are mostly interested in, you know, shoring up uh, privacy regimes that are already currently there. Uh, for the countries who have not put together uh, a data protection law, uh, the general, um, you know, say lag is in part about infrastructural gaps. Many people saying we don't really need a data protection law if we simply don't have the fiber optic capabilities. And so that general lag is in part because of infrastructure gaps that Chinese companies have promised to help close. Uh, at another level, uh, it's really about an uncertainty about well, what are the implications for data protection law, specifically for growing uh, startup ecosystems and SMEs. And so, you know, uh, the, the, let's say the slowness to enforcement of data protection on the continent um, is both about infrastructure, but it's also really about general trepidations, about uh, anxieties, about what does a data protection law mean for an emerging uh, startup ecosystem. So within, let's say, within that context, you find, uh, you know, uh, a civil society that is trying to effectively shore up um, surveillance uh, and uh, data protection laws, uh, but with a kind of government that sits almost uneasy about uh, what to do exactly, in part because because the general procurement of these systems comes under development and comes under Chinese, you know, sustained support for the last couple of years, uh, while simultaneously it's actually not doing what it's intended to do. 
Um, and so uh, civil society, and I'd say the general population has anxiety, but you know, state actors um, are, are being quite slow. Um, Thank you. Um, Maya, can you please talk about the use of surveillance in Xinjiang and how does it compare to the use of surveillance in other parts of China? Um, thank you. Um, I um, was having some audio issues. So I didn't, I probably missed Emil's first part of his answer. So if that presents any overlap at all, please excuse me. Um, I would just start by describing what I think is happening to, um, in China and Xinjiang in, in general, and is a multi-layered and multi-dimensional kind of surveillance system. Uh, first of all, at the very basic level is the requirement that everybody has to have an ID number. Um, and uh, then the next requirement is that people, in order to access public surfaces, uh, like going on a long train, well, a train ride, a long bus ride, uh, or accessing the internet, uh, having a phone number, you have to tie these services to your ID number. It's a requirement called the real name registration uh, requirement. Um, and then the next level is what I think Emil was talking about, the kind of the, the mass biomet uh, biometric collection. Um, particularly in Xinjiang and Tibet, that is the case, but also throughout China, there has been kind of these um, drives by the police to collect um, biometrics, whether we're talking about iris scans or DNA. Um, in There have been some um, cases of uh, even collection of people's gait information, like the way they walk, um, you know, obviously, you know, facial um, images, um, uh, voice samples, that kind of collection of biometrics is, you know, often um, not, not connected to a particular crime uh, or even uh, of a geographical region, but like, you know, the police goes and to the schools, to the internet cafes, to a group of migrant workers, collecting all kinds of these kind of biometrics, storing them in police um, databases. So that's at the next level. And then at the, at the next level is that um, the police has installed these you know, sensory systems in public places. And by that, you know, the, the one form of that would be um, the surveillance um, camera systems that is quite you know, um, intuitive. It is collecting visual information um, in a particular given public space. Um, but often I think it is misunderstood that these camera systems are really only just collecting, you know, comparing who is in front of a camera, right? Like identifying them and that sort of thing. What these systems actually do is, you know, the use of artificial intelligence in the form of recognizing um, things, objects, colors. So let's say a red umbrella, a blue car, uh, recognizing the number on the number plate, recognizing the direction of, of certain movements with the idea that um, the, the police can also track or you know, set parameters to look for particular patterns. Um, maybe we're looking for someone with an arch eyebrow walking south towards the capital of, I don't know, walking south of Urumqi towards this, the train station. That, that sort of idea, right? Like whether or not these systems get put in practice, we, we, we can talk about that. It's, it's also not as, uh, as clean as, as I think the Chinese government's publicity materials make it. So these are the sensory systems. Oh, and then very important part of the sensory systems is also the collection of um, non-biometric, but identifying information, primarily your phone, in, um, the, the identifying information emitting from your phones. Um, I am EI number, uh, your MAC address, these are these are things being emitted that identify you because most of the time you're carrying your phone. And these sensory systems that are installed in the public places, like in Xinjiang, they, they were, you know, uh, on these poles, but also when you walk through a checkpoint, which are numerous um, during the height of the crackdown, these sensory systems collect these various forms of identifying information and constantly use and this is where the big data comes in. We've looked into one particular big data system called Integrated Joint Operations Platform, IJOP. And what IJOP does is kind of collates and collects all these kind of sources of information. Some of them are like stat static, like you know your ID number, your familial relations. Some of them are or your banking information. Some of them are kind of um, uh, dynamic um, information that is about you know wh which checkpoint do you go past? Um, do you go to the guest? how many times a day. And it, these big data systems like IJOP have parameters. So they are programmed to recognize certain um, 
kind of irregularities. So if you, the, the IGOP, we look into the system, we reverse engineer parts of it, we didn't have access to the database itself, but just to an app that's connected to it. We see that the, the police, for example, are looking for people who use too much electricity, people who donate to the mosque, um, people who are connected to families abroad, uh, who call people abroad, who receive phone calls from abroad, people who have, um, you know, certain audio visual files, um, including um, uh, recitations of all the chapters of the Quran. Um, and when the system pick up these individuals who have quote unquote abnormal behavior, according to the authorities, because as you can see, almost all the behavior I've described are essentially ordinary behavior most people many places engage in. But nonetheless, the system secretly consider them as essentially problematic and then dispatch the authorities, the police, neighborhood officials to go and interrogate these people, some of whom then end up in arbitrary detention, political education camps, as well as long years of imprisonment. Now, the only difference, well, there are several differences between Xinjiang and the rest of China. One is that th these systems actually, the way I'm des I describe them as layers, many of these layers, you can find them in the rest of China. However, um, it is the goal, the governance goal that these systems support. In Xinjiang, they support the crackdown against Uyghurs. They are discriminatory against the Uyghurs. They are targeting the Uyghurs every move. In the rest of China, because you don't have this kind of crackdown, they support other governance goals. Sometimes it is actually right now that authorities are saying what well, we're cracking down on online frauds, um, drug use and, and drug trafficking is another is another one. So or you know um, the, um, there is some evidence that some of these systems though. Not, maybe not in this particular way. Um, it's also, you know, uh, uh, looking at, you know, people who petition, who people who complain about the government. So surveillance is most visible, intrusive in Xinjiang, but the surveillance system and how the way that they are structured, the philosophy behind the systems are very similar. And then other very important um, uh, difference between Xinjiang and the rest of China is that in Xinjiang, during the crackdown there, um, the surveillance system work together with the with the camps, with the prisons, with the checkpoints. They essentially make this entire region the size of I think it, it is like five Californias, if I if I'm good enough with my geography, a, a really big space, let's say, uh, with a with a with a uh, 22 million population. Uh, half of them are Uyghurs, a, a region that big with that big size of population, but turning that region into essentially a uh, um, um, access control region. So depending on how de uh, trustworthy you are in the authorities book or the system, you are given different levels of quote privilege. Some people are imprisoned, or they're not anywhere outside of prison. Some people are in the camps, they may be released uh, after some time. And then some people are only allowed in their locales where they live. If they have to go to town, to the supermarket, to uh, you know buy groceries, then they would be subjected to inter interrogations because the checkpoints would actually like light up and make a noise when you walk through them. So the what is I think missing sometimes in a in the Western reporting about Xinjiang is that oh it's it's mostly about the camps, it's about the surveillance, but they I think it's often missing is the understanding that the Chinese government actually achieved something quite incredible of locking down the region of Xinjiang similar to kind of a gated access control system. Um, and to what extent this can continue further with the investment it requires, with the economy that is, you know, to be quite honest, during that period of time, not going very well for Xinjiang, for a size, for a country the size of China, I think is a question for the future of China. So I would just uh, stop there. Thank you, Maya. And that's actually, it's a great place for me to turn to Emil with my next question, which is really looking at, um, you know, Maya, you mentioned there's all this data that's being collected. You have the IJOP, um, which is trying to integrate the data. Um, and, you know, I, I guess my, my question is both present and then future focus. So, so the present part is how well is all of this data being integrated and analyzed? And, I, and, and with that, you know, what is that learning experience? What does that 
portend for the future as the government continues to improve and streamline data collection and integration methods. So basically, what does a potential future look like for Chinese citizens under a more advanced surveillance system? And are there is there any possibility of any measures or actions that could limit its reach? Yeah, I think to the point that was made by Amaya um, that, you know, we can see the immediate effects of these massive surveillance systems, specifically in Xinjiang. And um, while there might be a tendency among some commentators overseas to look at Chinese surveillance systems as kind of functioning as written, kind of a perfectly functioning totalitarian system, um, obviously there are budgetary constraints, there are practical constraints that limit the day-to-day uh, -day effectiveness of certain methods of surveillance. Um, but just as a background condition of life in areas like Xinjiang, um, the effect is, um, you know, is, is awful for those people living under them. I think one of the things when we're considering the future of surveillance, uh, mass surveillance in China, one of the interesting tensions now is between recent government, Chinese government legislation that aims to protect the personal data privacy of Chinese citizens on the one hand, alongside continuing massively expanding police biometric or surveillance uh, surveillance programs on the other. So for example, the Chinese government has implemented uh, in 2019 uh, regulations on human genetic resource management. Uh, in 2021, it put in place the personal information protection law. Um, both of these documents place clear limits on the collection, retention, and processing of sensitive personal data by companies, private companies, research institutions and other organizations operating in China or uh, using data collected from Chinese citizens. Um, and in some ways, these laws, these regulations are welcome developments. Um, clear guidelines should be in place to ensure that the data of Chinese citizens or people residing in China are protected and the right to data privacy is respected. Um, however, uh, there's a big exception to these regulations and that exception relates to the Chinese police. So none of these new pieces of legislation meaningfully restrict the ability of the Chinese uh, police to collect, uh, process, or share sensitive data from Chinese citizens, including the kind of biometric data, DNA samples, and iris scans that police have collected en masse in the Tibet Autonomous Region and Qinghai, or the kind of biometric data collection programs or just personal data collection programs that Maya just described that um, were put in place in Xinjiang. So even with these pieces of legislation in place, uh, Chinese police still have wide remit to surveil individuals or communities and make use of the data they collect for whatever purpose they see fit. So if we're thinking about what the future of mass surveillance will look like for Chinese citizens, I imagine it will be a combination of stricter controls on the ability of non-state actors to collect sensitive data from Chinese citizens or people residing in China, combined with expanding police surveillance or state surveillance over the general public. Um, and this tension will remain because of the, the character of policing in China. Uh, the party state does not want to constrain the power of the Ministry of Public Security or other law enforcement agencies to surveil the public because the Ministry of Public Security and other law enforcement agencies are key to the party state's ability to tackle perceived threats to national security, social stability, and one party rule. Um, so it's possible in the future that the Chinese government will come up with legislation to provide a kind of post facto legal basis for the kinds of mass surveillance or mass biometric data surveillance programs that we've been discussing today. Um, but even in the absence of such legislation, police will likely continue to collect mass biometric uh, or conduct mass biometric data collection programs um, and will likely expand these programs. Um, and this is because, again, of the character of policing in China, but also because the Xi administration, as I mentioned before, takes an incredibly expansive view of what it considers to be threats to national security, social stability, or one-party rule. Um, what's more, if we think, uh, what are the things that might uh, prevent mass police surveillance in the future? Unfortunately, those things are largely absent in China. So these would be external checks on the power of the party state, like opposition political parties, uh, independent social uh, civil society activism, a free press, and an independent judiciary. So essentially, the only thing that's constraining the police's surveillance programs in China, other than practical or budgetary limitations, is the decision of the party state that these surveillance programs are not its interests. And again, given the fact that the Xi administration has a particular obsession with national security and understands national security in incredibly broad and flexible terms, it's hard to imagine that the current Chinese government 
current C administration will decide to roll back these mass surveillance programs in the future, even if it continues to put in place legislation that's ostensibly there to protect the right to data privacy of Chinese citizens or people residing in China. Thank you. Um, and for those listening, if you have a question at any point, please feel free to put it in the Q&A box. I'm going to get one more question in and then I'll turn to the Q&A box. Um, and we do have a little bit of extra time today just because this is part of our deep dive program. So we will go until quarter past one. So uh, one Eastern time, quarter past one Eastern time. So Bulalani, um, mm -hmm. with all of that information, as China's global footprint, global footprint expands, are there measures that countries can take to safeguard their citizens against this data intensive surveillance? And on the flip side, are there actions that liberal democracies that um, have a different relationship, let's say with privacy, are there actions that liberal democracies can take with respect to countries that want this technology in order to slow down the spread of its use? Yeah, sure. So, you know, um, first, I'd say there, there are definitely, you know, a series of things that can be done to ameliorate this kind of um, growing trepidations around the proliferation of surveillance systems, but more importantly, their general implementation. But, you know, I'll first start by saying really, uh, the challenge is, is really um, about the gap between the speed of adoption of these systems and the checks and balances currently in place within the context of global South countries. Uh, you know, many of them are procuring them on um, what I'd say at least permissible grounds, if not legitimate grounds, uh, while simultaneously also not really understanding the general kind of um, uh, appropriate application in terms of, you know, what exactly can they be used for without exacerbating or leading to a moment in which there is a kind of recession in, in, rela in relation to civil liberties. And so, um, at one level, the challenge, uh, and say using um, um, you know African countries for example, at one level, it's simply about putting together a kind of you know policy framework or legal framework in place, um, like you know data protection laws, or simply putting together regimes around uh, privacy. Now, you know, having the letter of the law is, is quite different from kind of executing it. Uh, obviously, for those African countries that simply do not have it, uh, the African Union, for example, has a cybersecurity convention of 2014. Currently, about um, 14 countries have signed it. Uh, in order for it to kind of go into effect, they need 15 signatures. That general framework does offer for a more continental-wide uh, regime around data protection and cybersecurity. And that's definitely one good place. Um, Another kind of part of it is simply improving capabilities uh, to promote uh, civil liberties and in particular cybersecurity. Um, and so, you know, uh, for example, again, you know, uh, many African kind of countries are uh, particularly short staffed in their data protection commission offices. And so, you know, supporting those offices is kind of one key way in which you can go about promoting, um, you know, data protection and civil liberties. Uh, while simultaneously also supporting them uh, in understanding how to kind of appropriately use these surveillance systems while remaining, you know, um, kind of healthy democratic spaces. Uh, the, and then also really uh, helping kind of the creation of kind of um, data commissioner offices that are somewhat independent of the state. So for example, in the, in the context of Kenya, uh, while they did put together a data protection commission, it's still under the ICT ministry. And so it is the government effectively deciding when and when not to restrict its collection and use of data, which is you know, similar to kind of um, the examples uh, expanded on in, in the context of China. And so, you know, uh, building out kind of independence for some of these regulators is a challenge. Um, and it's kind of worth pursuing. And then I'd say, you know, lastly, uh, it's, it's really uh, about uh, supporting and meeting, you know, local governments and state actors where they are. Um, the reality is that the current kind of discourse surrounding the proliferation of um, Chinese surveillance systems really concentrates on the supply side. So really analysis as to what are the kind of either corporate or geopolitical interests that are, uh, resulting in the proliferation and not really thinking about, well, uh, exactly why a local state um, and sub-state actors interested in these systems in the first place. And one of the general crucial 
uh, reasons is simply closing digital infrastructure gaps as a way in order to effectively meet the what I call this digital inflection point um, and kind of arresting some of the general kind of you know inequalities that have existed between the global north and south um, and the current general rhetoric that specifically focuses on you know trying to dissuade say local African state holders from working with Huawei and not offering a kind of a financially reachable alternative simply is, is a point that speaks literally against kind of uh, local interests. And so, you know, in kind of aiming to kind of truncate the general proliferation, it's also important to really think uh, more carefully about, well, what are the, uh, you know, material conditions that are actually promoting the growing geopolitical footprint and growing corporate footprint of Chinese uh, companies in the global south. And the reality is, is that they're simply, you know, doing the work on the ground and offering financially reachable alternatives to kind of global north suppliers. Thank you. Um, turning to the Q&A box now, um, Maya, I'll start with you with this question. And again, you know, Emil Bulalani, if you'd like to contribute, please you know, feel free to add on to, to any answers. Um, this question, Maya, is how effective are U.S. export controls to target technologies with potential military or and surveillance applications? Are the controls well designed and enforced and how are var various allies supporting or undermining US efforts? So again, looking at the at the export of technologies from abroad, which I think we just touched upon, um, you know, how, how, how do you get a sense of how that's uh, functioning in reality? Yeah, uh, well, thank you. Um, the US export control regime is somewhat complicated and it has many different kinds of <clears throat> controls that we're talking about and, and you know, different technologies and different companies. So I don't, um, I'm not an expert on all the different forms that are cur currently being put in place, even though there are some that are um, restrictions primarily motivated by essentially, you know, stopping them, uh, well, essentially focusing on Chinese surveillance companies. Um, however, as I understand it, I mean, the, the primary body um, of the U.S. agency responsible for imposing these kind of controls um, in the Commerce Department um, are, are rather small, uh, even though I think they, they try their best and they have experts and they work with, you know, civil society and other researchers uh, like us in, in, in um, designing some of these systems. It is still an enormous problem to be solved by a very small group of people. Um, so, for example, the Chinese surveillance system uh, in, in ecosystem uh, probably includes hundreds of different companies. Some of them are more like names that we would know because we see them printed on the cameras. But then you have also have you know the cloud servers and and uh, you know all these different you know different processing um, at the back that is really hard for uh, you know a few researchers to really uh, get down down to the list and then have them you know, put on the, the list of sanctions. Um, so that's one challenge is, is the, re the gap of research and, and sanctions. And then the other part is you know, you're kind of running behind, right? Like what uh, Bulalani was saying that, you know, you, you could try to understand it and try to put sanctions on it. Then the technology already moved on. Um, and then you, of course, have lots of them are Chinese domestic companies, right? Because China wants to be um, cyber, cyber sovereign. Um, and then on top of that, you also have the issue of, um, you know, there's the US efforts um, in terms of allies. Um, many of the other governments have not really gone that far in terms of sanctioning either government, Chinese government officials for human rights abuses or the surveillance companies. So there is also a gap there, even though it is US technology generally or know-how that that would find its way to these Chinese companies. So China, US controls are really quite important, um, but um, it's just a matter of you know, changing from the, the whack-a-mole exercise to, to kind of more comprehensively thinking about you know, what does the ecosystem look like? How do we actually uh, exert the, lead, the most targeted uh, ability to control these technologies? And then, you know, if we are really interested in, in close stopping proliferation, then you have to look at the demand side of the, of the equation, um, as well as, I think, addressing the U.S.'s own role in um, 
being essentially a technological and thought leader in surveillance um, that uh, may give a lot of ideas to Chinese researchers themselves about how to do any of these. Um, so um, I think uh, right now, I think the US um, often is perceived by many people, many um, civil uh, society um, organizations, digital rights activists, as, as much of an impediment to better digital rights globally, um, you know, as, as China is, even though, of course, China's abuses are, are you know, so much more severe, um, but in terms of the innovation involved in, in surveillance um, and the power to, to put um, your words into actions, I think the US still has quite a long way to go. Thank you. And that's actually a great segue to a next question, which I'll direct to you, Emil. Um, and the questioner asks, what is the real difference between what the Chinese state is doing versus what states in the quote unquote developed world are already doing? After all the data we use on our cell phones, surveillance can cameras abounding in cities like London are following and collecting big data on people without their knowledge. Um, the, in, you know, the question goes on, but you know, how, where is the line? between what's happening in, um, in other countries and what's happening in China? Well, I think that question raises a very good point, which is that probably a good way to look at any of these programs, be they in China, be they in the United States or elsewhere, is to put them in a comparative perspective, right? To recognize that mass surveillance, police surveillance, state surveillance is not unique to any one particular country. Um, what's more, um, if we're to adopt a principled opposition to this kind of unconstrained state power and constrained police power, um, yeah, it needs to be principled, it needs to be one that can call it abuses in any country in which uh, these practices take place. Um, so I actually think that uh, both the work I've done and the work that I'll be doing in the future uh, has really been enriched um, by the critiques of mass surveillance or of policing practices by, say, America-based uh, experts, America-based advocacy organizations, America-based, uh, uh, U.S.-based um, community organizations, right, who've called out those kind of abuses. Um, so I think it's probably important for us when we're looking at China to remember in the back of our heads that we don't place China at the furthest end of a spectrum and then compare, say, ourselves in Canada or the United States or elsewhere uh, favorably simply because we haven't reached that particular end of the spectrum, right? Um, in fact, many of the surveillance programs that uh, the Chinese government has put in place are directed against the same kinds of marginalized groups that uh, police target here in Canada or the United States or elsewhere. Again, users of drugs, people with community records, um, people with uh, mental health issues and whatnot. Um, so again, a principled analysis, principled critique of these programs needs to be one that's comparative. Uh, what I will say, though, when it comes to China, is that what makes these particular programs in China more pernicious is a point that I raised earlier, which is that there really are not the kinds of external checks on the power of the Chinese government that one sees in liberal democracies. So we don't see opposition political parties with the power to call out the Communist Party. We don't see uh, unconstrained or relatively unconstrained press that's able to report freely on these programs. Um, civil society activism has been deeply restricted or constrained under the current Xi administration. Um, it's also unlikely or impossible for uh, the judiciary to hold uh, the Chinese state to account, right? When people attempt to bring cases alleging police abuse um, or unwarranted surveillance of their activities. So what that means is effectively the only check on the authority or the power of the state to engage in these practices is either technical or budgetary constraints or a what I think is actually a rather naive hope that the Chinese government won't use these programs for the purpose of deepening state surveillance or oppression, especially against marginalized communities. Um, and again, we just have to look at the record of policing practices within China. We look at the nature of the or the character of China's political system. We see ample evidence that the Chinese government is willing to flout not just international law, but its own domestic laws to pursue people that it considers to be threats. Um, so in my for, for me, I think the Chinese state, like any state, it's up to them to come up with a convincing reason why they have granted themselves the kind of a power and authority they have to engage in mass surveillance over the public. Again, a question I would ask of the United States government, of the Canadian government, of any government, be it 
authoritarian, illiberal, liberal, liberal, democratic. Um, but again, in the case of what makes the journal uh, pushback that might occur. Great. Um, thank you. Um, Bulalani, turning to you, to what extent are tech companies based in Europe, the United States, or elsewhere competing with Huawei or other PRC-based companies to provide this surveillance security tech in Kenya or the um, Global South more broadly? So the, this person says, I'd appreciate hearing more from this broader perspective on the mat matter of tech actors and state power. Yeah, sure. Um, so, you know, I think, you know, and I guess I'll also try, try and also speak to the direct point that was made previously, because I think it it's quite important in part because generally I think there's um, a general presumption that somehow you know China is unique, um, and uh, the argument is not that China is unique at least as relates to mask surveillance. It's more so that we locate difference, particularly both at the level of the absence of checks, but also in the context of how we choose to leverage demand factors in the context of global south countries to promote geopolitical ends. Um, and there being a kind of connection be, between both corporate actors, but also Chinese interests in the proliferation of, of some of these systems. And, and it kind of relates to kind of non-Chinese actors in kind of surveillance ecosystems. It is very much there, you know, I've kind of within my own personal work, I've kind of demonstrated that um, African uh, countries um, and also countries we live across the global South are making as surveillance operations and uh, those are enabled not simply by you know Chinese actors um, many European many Israeli uh, in particular Israeli companies are also involved in building out those capabilities and so for example in the context of say Kenya you'll find that like you know that the cameras themselves are you know uh, Huawei or Dahua cameras but they're are running on say Oracle software for example. Um, and similarly, you know, some of the more kind of, uh, say, uh, spyware um, is generally procured, say, from uh, Israel, but some of the facial recognition systems found on the border um, are found, you know, to be sourced from Hong Kong. Um, and so, you know, many kind of African countries are generally procuring surveillance uh, technologies uh, on, on the grounds of one, uh, you know, promoting their own kind of domestic surveillance operations while simultaneously reaching for financially reachable products across uh, the kind of, I'd say, cyber capable and surveillance markets. Um, it's just that, you know, um, many of the kind of general Chinese operators provide uh, products uh, that are financially reachable, but also products that come as um, a package, which is also quite unique. And so when you're buying from a Chinese vendor, it's not simply that you're getting a camera, it's also that you're getting a series of other things. Uh, and sometimes it also comes with a loan that also makes it even more reachable. And so when we're thinking about the general proliferation of Chinese systems, we're talking about a more kind of coordinated operation uh, at the very least. Now, whether that kind of you know, coordinated should then be used as a kind of the litmus test for dystopic futures is a kind of an, another kind of question. Um, uh, but in terms of kind of making, you know, hybridized surveillance systems with the aid of um, American and sometimes Israeli companies, that is um, a fact on the ground. Great. Uh, thank you. Um, Maya, turning to you, I'm going to combine a couple of questions here. We have one question. Um, and the questioner asks, when Chinese nationals leave the country, is their surveillance system still able to keep tabs on them? And then another where they're asking, um, uh, oh, where, where did that one go? <laughs> oh, yes, here we go. Um, they're, they're wondering about uh, the role of technology and surveillance systems um, in conducting surveillance and intimidation on dissidents abroad, as well as more, you know, the, the use of more analog traditional methods um, in that surveillance abroad. It lives in the case of New York City. I think just recently they discovered a, a Chinese police outpost. So um, how yeah. is China conducting surveillance abroad? Well, it depends on where abroad is. Um, you, you have um, 
place, uh, you know, typical, let's think uh, we are in a, a Western government or a Western country, um, it depends, right? Um, in some government, uh, in some countries you have like, on the one end, I do think in the US, um, the US government has been um, very in a very high profile way instructed as domestic um, law enforcement, the FBI. Um, and I, I would imagine that various surveillance, um, you know, is being conducted to and, and also going out to the Chinese diaspora community to really push a message to say, uh, if you suffer any intimidation or surveillance, come to us and talk to us. So I do think that um, here in the US, um, there is, because of, of that visibility, there's also less uh, surveillance in terms of, you know, analog, traditional human to human surveillance here. Um, and then in terms of technological surveillance, um, you also don't you, you, you also don't really have these kind of sensory systems that we were describing about in China, right? On the other hand, um, if you use WeChat, many of the people from China do use WeChat for communications, um, then you're falling into essentially kind of a different digital ecosystem that exposed yourself to more kind of tracking and collection of data. Um, but here, you know, the, 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 um, the really big difference, and I think what Emil was, was answering that question, is about, you know, how surveillance is conducted in China versus outside of China, is that in China, the information is collated, integrated. And this is where it becomes really hard to move because, you know, the, the Chinese Communist Party essentially controls a lot of, you know, surveillance powers, um, enforcement powers, and military power. And as a Chinese citizen inside China, you have very little ability to contest the whatever treatment you're going to be receiving. Whereas outside, you may have WeChat on, on your phone, but, you know, if they, they surveil on you, but that information, you know, there's also a distance between Tencent the company to the Chinese Communist Party, right? Um, so to what information is being handed over depends on who you are, how how important you are to the Chinese government's goals, depends on how how Tencent is handing that information and what kinds and when. So that, that surveillance is a lot weaker, technologically speaking. And then when you're in the US, I think in humans, human to human interaction is also much weaker. However, the main concern for a lot of Chinese diaspora is that you every single person has a family person uh, they care about back home so that is the weakest point is that there, there you can really sh essentially shut up anyone um so but then it depends like and then if you are in southeast asia where the technical infrastructure there is much more captured by the chinese companies ecosystem digital ecosystem maybe your shopping is done on alibaba um your hotel registration system your you you're going out um with a, the dd taxi service you know maybe again it depends on this company's relationship with the chinese state which there is a distance however in the back of your mind you'll be thinking mm, i'm not too sure i'll just delete I'll, I'll just not say whatever i'll just not meet this person so it depends on where you are and i think in southeast asia you have much more of that influence both human and technological that makes the chinese diaspora there much 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 more cautious about speaking out against the chinese government Great. Th thank you for that. Um, Emil, we have a question about how the surveillance system has been used in recent protests, such as Hong Kong protests or the protests against China's zero COVID policy. How have you seen the surveillance system working there? Um, well, I think um, I'm sure Maya has done a lot more work looking at this than myself, but I can at least speak to um, following the protest the, uh, that happened last year. Um, after the Urumqi fire and in response to the COVID lockdowns. Um, there are a number of reports um, coming out by journalists who were uh, in China at the time and speaking with people who had uh, participated in the protest that their phones were being examined by the police. In some cases, biometric data like iris scans are being taken from individuals who participated. Um, I think uh, I, it seems to me that the protests caught the Chinese government uh, off guard. Um, and it also seems that many of the people who are participating in these protests were um, perhaps not the kind of people who would have been mobilized in the past. Um, what is interesting to me is that many of these people then um, having participated in the protest and having then perhaps been uh, intimidated, harassed or detained by the Chinese police have now had a bit of a, in a sense, a very personal interaction, very personal taste of what the kind of surveillance apparatus 
the Chinese state has put place, what that looks like, what that feels like. Um, again, it seems to me that one of the, the most immediate effects of mass surveillance in China um, is not even the collection of the data, so to speak. It's simply the knowledge that those systems are put in place. And that, to Maya's point, um, it leads people to maybe constrain their activities in a way that they feel will make them less susceptible to state harassment or intimidation. So it's possible that um, following the protests of late last year, the anti-lockdown uh, protests, many of the individuals who participated, um, who were then visited or uh, by the police or um, intimidated or harassed by the police, the effect may be to uh, warn them against further participation in uh, in-person activities or even the discussion of these kinds of activities online. Um, and that has a ripple effect too, even for individuals who are not directly participating they may know people who participated, they may have family members who participated, and those individuals may also, um, you know, become less likely to participate in uh, mass activity in the future. Um, I should also note, though, that um, I think this also makes those protests all the more remarkable, um, because people were actually willing to brave the surveillance state, brave the threat of uh, police repression or harassment to go out in the streets and actually express uh, their deep frustration, disapproval of the Xi administration's handling of the uh, of the pandemic uh, at that point in time. Um, but yeah, I think Maya has done much more extensive and interesting work on uh, the protests say, in Hong Kong um, and the COVID lockdown protests than myself. Yeah. Oh, so Maya, anything you'd like to add to that? Thank you, Emil. Sorry, is that to me? Yes, yeah, if there's anything you'd like to add, get, given given the extensive work that, that you've done on, on that area. Yeah, um, in terms of the um, Hong Kong protests, let me just, I, I think Emil answered um, uh, uh, quite, you know, quite extensively about the zero COVID protest. Um, I think here, one point I'd like to add is that we don't know very well, um, you know, because our understanding of China's surveillance system is quite spotty, uh, depending on what information comes out. Um, this, what happens after zero COVID is actually quite interesting to me to see whether or not the Chinese government was really caught off guard, or in some ways they have become more sophisticated. If you look at um, the response afterwards, a number of people were taken into custody, some of them, you know, faced more serious consequences, but nonetheless, you know, they didn't roll the tanks in town, right, like, you know, a 1989 protest, which created an enormous um, uh, response internationally. So you could see that perhaps the combination of surveillance, um, the quote, the use of the legal system controlled by the party, intimidation tactics, essentially give them a nuanced ability to respond with nuanced and with, uh, with like kind of different grades of reaction, depending on who you are and how, how much of a threat you are, then they act in the background. So in some ways, it's become more sophisticated since 1989. And that was really the intention of the party as well. That is something to keep in mind. Um, on the other hand, the other side of the, the other uh, end of the story, could, well, um, the, the surveillance system could have broken down. Xinjiang, you see in the rest of China, the idea of the systems is to um, identify threats, right? But when you have that people protesting, the system just can't figure out everybody could be a threat, right? Because everybody could have grievances against the party. Then, you know, maybe there was a breakdown. So we don't know because we don't have to have the data to tell which side of that story we are landing on. In terms of the Hong Kong protests, I'll just be very brief in the sense that none of the systems we describe in China are actually have been put in place in Hong Kong in terms of mass surveillance. Because you have to remember, Hong Kong was, you know, ruled by the British. And then, you know, during the, the handover, after the handover from, from China, um, you know, they, they didn't impose, they didn't have the uh, direct ability to manage Hong Kong in a way that would put in place similar mass surveillance infrastructure. And so we have not observed the same way of social control, but you are going to see 
I think more and more movement towards all of that with the imposition of the national security law, starting from the requirement of real name registration. We already see that in Hong Kong with regard to phone registration. Now you have to have your ID tied to your phone and so on and so forth. To what extent, um, when? Because the Chinese internet from the very start were designed to be essentially a, a walled off garden, so as to speak. Um, uh, these big multinational um, uh, social media companies from the West never really had uh, much access to that markets because it was designed that way. Whereas Hong Kong was is already kind of very porous. Everybody used Google, Facebook, and so on. How how are you going to kind of post? Uh, you know, after after the fact of designing your internet, how are you going to wall it off? It's going to be a question. Like it won't be. I I, I don't think it would be more like the challenges. Perhaps it's similar to places like Russia, where you have a very big population already using the, the kind of the international internet, so as to speak, versus the the Chinese internet. But but again, my my expertise on on those countries are limited. But Hong Kong is a different uh, situation altogether. But that's not to say that is the situation there is not deteriorating very quickly. But just on the area of technology, it looks very different. Okay, uh, thank you. And Bulalani, we have a question here about um, uh, about the objective behind why China sells uh, these surveillance systems to other countries of the global south. And, and you and you did address that, but I think you know we'd like you to get more specific into the relationship between companies and the government that that you alluded to, and how does that affect the objectives of selling surveillance systems abroad? Yeah, sure. Um, so I guess um, I guess starting at the top again. So the kind of three primary factors, um, and those primary factors kind of um, change over time. But say, for example, uh, you know, it's about kind of corporate expansion at one level. Two, uh, it's about kind of you know uh, promoting China's um, geopolitical interests within the given region of Africa. And then lastly, it's about domestic factors and how these, um, say, factors interplay also produces a series, a series of kinds of discussions that are worth having. But to kind of start, I guess, at, at the level of, say, um, corporate interests, um, you know, companies like Huawei have been in East Africa since really about 1995. Uh, the initial introduction into the African markets was simply contingent on offering uh, basic ICT services and products uh, that eventually kind of transformed over time from simply laying fiber optic capabilities to introducing smart cities and then eventually surveillance technologies. Uh, the shift to smart cities in particular uh, was a part of, uh, you know, domestic concerns about kind of catching this digital inflection point. It's a part about further securitizing African urban centers. And then it's also really about uh, ameliorating traditional challenges like crime. And so all of this stuff really comes under the banner of, of development. But you know, a more kind of critical question as to whether or not one can draw a direct correlation between the adoption of, say, smart city technologies uh, that include facial recognition systems and biometric identification to the actual problems that you know, they supposedly address. There is no direct correlation between these systems. And that's kind of where many of the general claims under development kind of fall apart. And so in terms of thinking about, uh, you know, geopolitical interests, um, you know, China in particular, uh, I'd say it's twofold. At one level, it's really about promoting some of the normative expectations about how the internet should be governed. Um, and they've been interested in effectively promoting what they've been effectively terming cyber sovereignty, which you know, is a kind of a limited conception of the internet in itself that is mostly driven by state control. And how you've seen that general promotion at one level has been through FOCAC, which is effectively the forum on, Af on China and Africa relations. And there they've been in particular, you know, uh, trying to convince African uh, stakeholders to think more actively about the place of the internet and but also the, the, the role of uh, the state in that. Um, that also then bleeds into not only simply offering some of the smart city technologies that you'll see on the ground, but also in some of the general training programs. And so you've seen African say uh, police services going over to Shanghai 
in Beijing receiving uh, training. Uh, that general training is partly connected to helping African stakeholders uh, both think through, but also practice, uh, you know, on, on how to go about using these surveillance systems. And then at, at another level, if you're seeing the general connection, uh, say, between uh, both, say, corporate and geopolitical, which you see, for example, in the context of, say, Kenya, but you also see it really across the continent, um, is that, you know, there's a, a gap between domestic technical capabilities, both in the promotion of civil liberties, but also in the actual use of some of these surveillance systems. And so they're heavily reliant on uh, Chinese training, but also Chinese engineers to execute them. And so, you, you know, for example, you'd walk into, you know, a surveillance headquarter and you'll see a number of kind of, you know, Huawei engineers supporting uh, surveillance. And there you also see effectively um, both not simply, you know, the technology itself, but also you're seeing a, a promotion of certain ideas on how about how to go about surveilling. Um, and, and so that's kind of where you see, I'd say, the kind of the promotional of, of ideas. Uh, I hope it gets to the question that you're asking. I hope so too. One, one quick final question for, for the three of you. Um, do you use TikTok? Uh, I think uh, I'm a little too old, so uh, it's 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 more uh, a, a personal preference. <laughs> Got it. I also don't use TikTok. Uh, I'm not sure, not because I'm not too old, but simply because I think it just missed me. You know, I kind of. Uh, okay. I also am not particularly good at the dance challenges. I you know. <laughs> but 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 do you uh, do you see it as an extension of of um, the 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 data collection? And, and I know we need to end. I just, I, we yeah. just got a question. Yeah, I feel yeah. like it's hard not to address this without. Oh yeah, questions. for sure, for sure, for sure. You know, so um, I'd, I'd say that like, you know, uh, Chinese scholarship on the question of the threats around the proliferation of the surveillance systems is at one level about misuse and also about normative value promotion. At the other level, it's simply about backdoor access to these technologies. And now, um, the establishing attribution is a rather kind of difficult task, particularly at the level of some of these technologies. Um, these technologies uh, sometimes do come with vulnerabilities, um, uh, including, you know, Dahua and, you know, some surveillance cameras coming from hack vision, for example. Um, but whether or not one can directly, you know, attribute the, you know, the, the vulnerability of the technology with a general uh, strategy around garnering access to data, um, is a, a bit difficult, at least kind of empirically establishing it. But that does not necessarily mean that it's not being intentionally done. Um, and what I've kind of advocated, at least in the context of the ground, but also in my own kind of personal work, is simply about improving domestic surveillance, uh, cyber, cyber security capabilities, in part because the general procurement of these systems, again, comes under with very little general scrutiny about how to kind of promote civil liberties, and that includes uh, cybersecurity. And so, you know, if one is thinking about the ubiquitous vulnerabilities of these systems, I think equally people should also be thinking about, well, you know, what kind of cyber security capabilities do we have to promote our general interests? And so it is, you know, uh, and, and so to me, in fact, you know, the, the, the concerns around attribution is actually obfuscating the actual concern. The concern is really at the level of the promotion of, of cybersecurity. Um, attribution is simply about whether or not we can determine who's doing it, but that doesn't necessarily support, you know, your domestic security interests. And I would well, just uh, very oh, quickly yeah. just mm. say, um, Citizen Lab colleagues at the Citizen Lab have done, I think, some really fantastic work on TikTok. So if anyone's interested, I would just urge them to Google TikTok Citizen Lab. Some great uh, reports okay. have been done by my colleague. Fantastic. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, with that, thank you all. This was a fantastic conversation. Thank you to everyone who listened. Um, really appreciate the great questions and the time and attention. Um, I think it's a fascinating conversation. Um, just a couple of housekeeping notes. If you're in New York, or actually if you're not, um, we're doing a conversation tonight. We're doing a film screening and a panel discussion about the human rights of refugees. So 
the conversation will be streamed and you can also get a link to view the film prior to that if you'd like. Um, and, and so please, um, you know, please feel free to RSVP to that um, event. And, uh, and as always, we are a nonprofit. So if you can donate to support our work, we encourage you to do so. Um, that it helps us keep these events free and open to people around the world. So with that, thank you all. Really appreciate the fantastic conversation and the extra time. So take care, thank everybody. You. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.